So at this stage, I am going to hand over to a lady called Carol. Um, Carol, it was part of the team that, that um, was a, you know, one of those groups that were successful and made a successful cough bid and are now running, running their pub in um, the Black Horse in Grimston in Leicestershire. So without further ado, Carol, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to you. Um, Carol, just shout as and when you want me to, um, to change the slides. Okay, David, thank you. Yeah, so put it onto the first slide then would be great. Yeah. So, um, yes, I'm the secretary of the Black Horse Community Group. Um, we're in, in the uh, middle of Leicestershire, uh, rural, rural village just outside Melton Mowbray. Um, and we are a registered community benefit society through through Plunkett. We use their model rules. We had a grant uh, in December 2022 and we opened at the 1st of February this year. And the slides I'm going to show you next, we just summarise some of the journey and I'll try and pick up some of the points. So this is what our pub looked like the week we bought it. Um, at that stage, when we bought it last May, May 2023, it had been closed for three and a half years. So that's why the windows are open for a start. Um, but it's about, well, for probably 400 years old. Um, it has continuous license records that still exist since 1753, according to the records office. Unfortunately, no records exist before that, but it's likely it was a pub before that. And it was owned by the local estate that the person who lived there, the publican who lived there, um, uh, you know, would have been publican part time. So one family, the Hill family, were there for over 100 years. And then they sold the freehold in 1957. Can you go on to the next slide, please, David? So our journey started in 2020 when the pub closed um, in, in 2020. Um, we'd got a fair good inkling what the owners were going to do. They're a local family who live in the parish. Uh, our parish is made up of three villages and, and the pub was the only pub in the parish. Only has 115 households that are that are lived in it has 121 according to the census and that can make a difference when you're working out percentages for uh feedback from surveys etc so make sure you get to the detail um so our parish council put in an acv registration uh, that was accepted by our local authority and the first planning permission application went in for change of use in march 2020 by the owners that was refused because we were an ACV, the moratorium, they then uh, issued that they were going to sell the pub and a moratorium was triggered in June 2020. We contacted um, Plunkett, a group of us. Uh, we had a, a village meetings. We set up a, a committee of eight. Uh, we contacted Plunkett. We had an advisor assigned to us who was great help. We put out a village survey in October 2020. Note during COVID year. So during that year, when you couldn't really meet, so we had to meet in the garden of, a, of one of the uh, main houses in the village, really spread out. Um, when we did the village survey, we hand delivered it to every single household in the parish. And then a week later, we went back and collected them. It's so important to get enough return. Our village hall has just done a survey and didn't bother doing that. They just had them sent out to every house uh, in the village, but expected people to return them. And only 23 out of 115 households returned them. That's 20% return. It's not good enough to make decisions on. So we hand collected every single uh, from every single household. And we had a 75% return rate. And of that, 91% indicated that the pub was either important or very important to, to keep. And that has been a founding, that the information back from that survey, I can't, under, I can't underline more strongly how important that's been for everything we've then done. The decisions on what the pub would look like, who, what we wanted, uh, what we wanted it to offer, 
uh, backing up any applications we made for any sort of funding. That has become a key note to always refer back to. We had a valuation carried out in November 2020 by, by the lovely Mike Hughes, who's a Plunky to Prove supplier. And, um, and, we, and during that time, the owners had also appealed the, um, the ACV registration and a, and a judge in the first tier tribunal dismissed that appeal in December 2020 and said that the pub was a single entity, uh, economic entity. And we made an offer in December 2020. We weren't a CBS at this point in time, but we made an offer in December 2020, actually on the basis that we knew they would refuse it. So we weren't actually risking too much at that stage. And the offers de uh, and the owners declined it. The valuation said that our pub was worth 285,000 closed or uh, market trading in default, which basically means that it's capable of trading, but no accounts, of 375,000. So we made a cheeky offer of 285,000. So it was understandable that they um, that they refused. Next slide, please. Next slide, David. Oh, thank you. Um, Yes, we did an early forecast on our financials. Again, I totally agree with David on how important those are um, because it showed that actually our pub was only probably going to be sustainable if we had to take out a loan. Hoff wasn't there around at that stage. And based on what funding was available, which was fairly limited, um, it actually showed when we did our forecast that the only way we could actually make the pub work was either offering a very attractive rent, but having a loan to buy the pub and then really struggling to meet the uh, payments for that loan, or we'd have to charge a much higher commercial rent. And with the state of the industry and the hospitality industry then and now, then those rents have become less and less sustainable or, or achievable based on the hospitality environment. So it became um, quite critical that we knew we would need to find some substantial funding to be able to afford to buy the pub. The owners listed the pub on the open market. at They offered it to us at £600,000. Um, which um, was obviously laughable, but they put it on the market at 550,000. We learned later that actually uh, they put it in the market through two agents in the end. And we under understood by conversations with those agents much later down the line when they weren't at, when the owners weren't actually a client that they'd thought that the pub was only worth between about around about 350,000. But the owners instructed it to go on the market at 550. We registered as a Community Benefit Society um, in February 2021 for, with the great help of uh, Plunkett. The second planning application went in in June 2021, but they'd taken professional advice. So when it became obvious that uh, it was going to be refused, then the owners withdrew the application. Um, there was a lot of negotiation going on with the owners all through this time because they just kept demanding this very high price. But they eventually did agree to have a purchase survey carried out, and we had that carried out in January 2022. And so we did get them to uh, agree in principle to sell to us at a more affordable price, which would allow us to make a cough application. And so we share, uh, we issued a share um offer in July 2022. The main reason being is my thinking was COF was uh, quite competitive. It was the early days. We wanted to be able to get our application over the line in competition with other people. So actually our thinking was that if we actually had our match funding in the bank, then that would give us the edge over somebody who hadn't got their, got the money in the bank. At that time, you had to have an actual 50% match funding. So our target was 230,000 um, and we made the cough application the day before closures in August 2022. Uh, the pub was estimated to be uh, valued at 375,000. We had a valuation to back that up. Repairs, we are estimated at 65,500 um, and we included in the application an updated valuation various letters of support. I hear the limit on five. I would have therefore had to create a number of documents with all our 
support letters in because we had over 20 support letters, MPs, ward councillors, county councillors, um, local businesses, all sorts of people who, who gave us support. Um, and uh, and, ver and various people who'd benefited from, from the pub when it had been open. So, and we put in things like our business plan, absolutely key document, which included all our risks. So we didn't have a separate risks um, document. All our risks are included in our business plan. Um, and in the end, we had 178 shareholders raised £249,200. And we may, and we were awarded what we'd applied for in December 2022. We were awarded uh, a capital grant of 220,000, just over 220,000, and a re revenue grant of just over 25,000. If I'd known uh, then what I know now and what some other groups have done, I probably would have gone for the whole 250,000 capital application and, and 50,000 revenue. And then if we hadn't spent it all, well, then we wouldn't have drawn it down. Um, whereas you can't apply for more. And the one thing that became quite, um, uh, it, you know, it might have been useful to have more. Can you go on to the next slide, please, David? Because we purchased the pub on the 9th of May last year. We got it over the line with 375,000 uh, with cough funding. But then we had to, um, this was part of the, so once we'd got the funding, unfortunately that meant our owners thought they could squeeze us for more money. Okay. Um, so that actually became a sticking point. Um, and we eventually got it over the line. They wanted overage clauses in it and they wanted us to pay their legal fees. So we agreed to pay the legal fees that would not have been covered by cough. And we um, agreed to pay them £224,999 for non-existent goodwill. That is not funded by COF either, It's not, nor is it funded by our shareholders. There were some people within the community, um, some individuals, a small group of individuals who were willing to actually cough up uh, that amount of money in total to get the deal over the line. So we were very, very grateful for that because the owners became e extremely difficult. Um, the The only other thing I would say as well is that um, at the overage clauses, I went back to cough and said that I, I didn't think it would be a sticking point. Really, I just so, told them what was what what it was going to be and what they would be funding. And as soon as I mentioned there were overage clauses, they actually turned around and became quite helpful over that because they said that that would actually alter what was in our grant agreement, and they would put extra legal clauses in there, which would mean that if somebody further down the line was going to benefit either through overage clauses, then they would want some of that. Thank you very much because they're very, very sensitive that people should not be able to benefit from them funding uh, these sort of community schemes. So by them saying that, we actually got rid of the overage clauses. Um, we advertised tenancy. We carried out repairs and refurbishments. Um, things had gone up since 2022 budgets. That's £65,500 that we'd, we were claiming for cough, you know, um, materials and everything went up for between 30 and 40 percent so in fact the final total we spent was nearly 80,000 and it's only because a lot of traders and suppliers gave free labor free material or mates rates and and some things we had to shelve and we have a lovely group of over 60 volunteers aged between six and six and 84 who gave their time that we actually we actually got all the repairs and refurbishments that we did done Cough also had to approve our selected tenant. Being fair, it's not a big thing. Uh, we just told them who the tenant was, sent them the heads of term sort of thing and said this is who it was. They just want to make sure that it's no sort of, you know, mafia gangster or something or 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 somebody sort of very unsavoury that they've got on some funny list somewhere they might hold that uh, says under no account must any of these people be involved in anything. So it, that, that was sort of a tick box exercise, really. It wasn't a big hurdle. But what we did find um, was that we had some very unexpected items. Even though you have a survey done, you can't have lots of things tested. And so we found, you know, the fire alarm system had to be completely replaced. So that was double what we thought it was going to be. 
there was a load of electrical work to get the electrical certifications, which turned out to be nearly four times what we thought they were going to be. All the cask and keg pipelines. Us, no experience of pubs at all, just thought the whole lot needed cleaning. Yes, well, we were under that illusion for not very long. Once we got the experts in, all of it had to, virtually all of it had to be replaced uh, to, so that we, and we had to pay for it to remain free of tie. So that was nearly £8,000 in the end that that cost. And a load of the kitchen equipment turned out not to be functioning properly. Some of it turned out not to have been even owned by the owners. And so um, that a lot of that had to be replaced as well. However, we did survive and uh, we opened uh, this year. Uh, last slide, please, David. And this is what our lovely pub looks like now. All the inappropriate paint has been removed, all been repointed with lime mortar. This will help with the damp problem inside. And the cement render has all been removed and has been replaced with some lovely new stonework. So that has been our journey. I think a couple of things I, I would say just to back up what David was saying was that um, when we applied, the <laughs> there wasn't a downloadable Word version. And uh, I had to copy and paste every single blooming question that was in the application because you could save the application as you went along. So I just went along and stuck dots in all the boxes so that it allowed me to save it and copy and pasted every single every single question, made it into a Word document. Um, a, a, a group of us or all, all the committee had been involved in doing the business plan. Uh, so I actually did the application, the first draft of the application for COF. Um, I, cop I, I wrote it all out. Um, then I got my chair to look at it and we, you know, redid various things. And then we put it out to two or three other members of the committee who are very good proofreaders and, and tend to look at things slightly differently so that they then tweaked and commented on it, et cetera. So that when we actually came to do the application, all I had to do was copy and paste all that, all those uh, answers into the application on that particular day. Um, also, we kept it down. There were two other key things I think we did. One is we never assumed the person reading it knew what we meant. So we spelled things out. We also used words they used. So in all those guidelines, if they use particular words, then use those particular words to explain what you're doing because those are the words that they're looking for really they're not you don't don't reinvent the wheel don't come up with another version of what what benefit might mean or what something might mean or social isolation might mean you know if those are the words they've used in some of those grant uh, those guidelines just reuse those words um because those are the words they're looking for um and and we also did we submitted a lot of our policies, equal opportunities, uh, roles and responsibilities, anti-fraud, all that sort of thing. And then when we filled these into the application, we just referenced them and we referenced page numbers in the business plan, uh, paragraphs in the business plan, so that they could just go and look for them rather than copying it all out into the application. And I suppose lastly, financially, that financial forecast is absolutely critical. We made sure ours was robust. We had copies of the, uh, when the pub was successful, the owner at that time gave us three years copies of her accounts. So we could look at sort of the balances between what, you know, how much labour had been as far as the turnover had been. We used the British, um, uh, the BPPA uh, benchmarking information. Um, we used other community benefit society pubs, um, some uh, which, you know, if you find them, either contact local people and go and see them and discuss it with them or download off the mutual benefit um, society um, off, off there. Uh, we used all those to test our financial assumptions and our financial workings. And then in reality, we still can't couldn't charge as much rent as we in, uh, originally thought we could. Okay, we can manage that, but um, do do not do not overestimate the income you might get, and do not underestimate the expenditure that you might have. I think that does me. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Carol. There's just an absolute wealth of amazing tips and experience in that 
Um, that's super, super helpful. Thank you. And I, I know f personally from your group that you've been, you know, you've been absolute soldiers. It's taken a really long time to get to where you've you've got to. Um, and there's real persistence uh, and hard work that's paid off. And I think that really came through from what you were saying. So and well done. Congratulations on opening. I think the only other thing I would say is that we decided very, very early on with the help of our Plunkett advisor, whether we were going for a tenancy model or running it ourselves model. You have to decide for your own community which is the best. So we have a community pub down the road who started after us and finished after us, so to speak, the bell. Uh, they've gone for a managed model. Uh, we went for a tenancy model um, because of our circumstances. So I, I would say neither is necessarily totally better than the other. You have to do work through it and decide what's best for, for your individual circumstances.